Hello and welcome. You are listening to the Investor Lab, and my name is Goose, and I am absolutely enraptured, filled with delight, and totally, absolutely bubbling with the fact that you're listening to me right now. Um, that says a hell of a lot about you. And I really appreciate you being on this journey with us. So I'm not going to waffle on too much longer because I really want to share with you some pretty cool stuff that we um, dug into on this episode. This episode was all about trying to find higher than average growth. And in fact, I interviewed um, two guys, uh, Sasha and Matt from a company called Higher Than Average Growth. That's the name of their website. And that website is basically bringing big data to the masses. It's taking huge amounts of big data analysis, applying machine learning and giving you access to the tools that are normally hidden behind smoke screens, smoke screens and and mirrors and all of that kind of stuff. And it's not usually available to the public. So it's a huge advancement for the average uh, average investor. We talked about all kinds of stuff, how, like what the core drivers are, uh, and which I think you're going to find very interesting because there is no one core driver according to these guys. And they, they would know, they're the guys processing all this data. So even talked about all kinds of stuff, how to train an algorithm, what's involved in it, and how where's, where, where technology and property is ultimately going. You know, we talked about stuff like, is it even possible to predict the future and what to degree of accuracy, what role does artificial intelligence and machine learning have in the future of property investing? Are we going to get to the point where you can have portfolios on autopilot based on purely algorithmic data and all kinds of stuff? So I know you're going to get a lot out of it. There's a heap of gold in here. We took a very dry topic and we made it interesting and engaging and malleable and tangible. So it does get quite techy. It does get quite nerdy in there. But you know what? There's there's a lot of gold in there. And if you're listening to this and you're listening to a, to a podcast called The Investor Lab, that tells me a couple of things. It tells me you don't mind a bit of information and you do love to think a little differently. So if you are looking for a bit of a leading edge advantage and you're looking to try to find that 1% that's going to give you the ability to outperform the average investor, well, this may very well be it, or at least something you hear in this episode may very well help spark you on that next little phase that's going to give you the outperformance that you seek and you desire. So of course, though, if you want to fast track your ability to do that, then of course, you can just reach out to us and we can just do all the work for you. That's what we do every day. Uh, we help investors outperform the market and build property portfolios 300 to 600% faster than the average investor. So if you just want to like fast track that, if you love the idea of analyzing data and, and getting a leading edge advantage and outperforming the average investor, but you just don't really have the time or really want to get stuck into it and just want to work with someone like me, then you can. All you need to do is head to www.dashdot.com.au, hit the contact us section, check it out there. Or, and of course, if you want more free resources, tools, guides, and all kinds of stuff that's going to support you further in this journey to do it yourself, just head to theinvestorlab.com.au. There's a treasure trove of stuff there. If you digest all the episodes of this podcast and everything that's on that website, you will have everything you need to go and do it exactly yourself. And that is our gift to you. But without further ado, I want to get stuck into this because there's a lot of dynamite in there and I really value your time just as much as I value my own. Thanks again for being here. And of course, if you like this or any of the other episodes, please make sure you share them, rate them, review them, get them out there, help us spread our message so that we can bring more value to you and the people you love. Anyway, let's get stuck into it. I look forward to seeing you on the inside. Hey guys, welcome back to the Investor Lab and I'm super excited with the um, the topic we're going to be covering today. We're going to be taking a slight deviation from the norm. We're going to be exploring the more technical side of how investors can get a leading edge advantage. We're going to be chasing the, the, the philosopher's stone, how to predict property price growth in a meaningful way and we are chasing higher than average growth with Matt and Alex from HTAG, higher than, higher than average growth. Matt, Alex, nice to have you on the show. How are you? Uh, nice to be here. Thanks for the inviting us, mate. Yes, mate, it's, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. See, one of the things that we really um, try and encourage quite a lot here at the Investor Lab is for people to think differently and think laterally. Now, as you guys, I'm, I'm sure, are uh, blissfully and abundantly aware, the real estate industry has a propensity to be very stuffy, square, stiff and we're constantly looking encouraging people to think differently and try and find those kind of leading edge advantages so i want to start this though because i understand a little bit about you guys and your platform i've been lucky enough to play around on it and have a little dig around and see some really cool stuff 
why don't you give our listeners a bit of insight into you know, who you are and, and what higher than average growth is and, and all of that kind of stuff. We'll start there. How's that? Well, I, I'll begin, Sasha. So, so I think firstly, it wasn't, I mean, the reason why we started was not because the industry was square and stuffy. Um, it was more because it was difficult. Um, when I say difficult, what I mean by that is that um, if you're an average Joe and you wanted to invest, it would really take you a long time to tick all the boxes in order to find the right property or the right area. I mean, I remember when I started, I guess, researching about property and property investment. I mean, I, my background is in building and development myself and sort of naturally I gravitated towards that. And, and for me to learn what affects price, price growth and what's a good investment and all of these other things, you know, I had to delve into demographics, population growth, um, unemployment, things that, you know, really I knew nothing about. Um, mm. And for me to find the right property or the right area, it took a really, really long time. And essentially, it's like a vicious circle. You know, you come to a point and then you realize, well, I haven't considered this as well. Uh, and then the process starts again and again and again and again and again. So I guess the reason behind our platform and why we decided to develop it was because uh, we wanted to simplify things for a lot of people, um, including ourselves primarily. That's how we started, but then it sort of evolved into a much bigger thing. And I guess we wanted to simplify for average Joe investors um, as well as buyers, agents, or other professionals that are, uh, I guess, you know, make a living from you know, giving advice um, in investment. Okay, awesome. All right, so we touched on a couple of really interesting things there and I want to dig into um, that a little bit more and I want to make sure we hear from both of you guys. Okay, so taking a little step back, you were looking for, you were trying to work out how the hell to find growth. Everyone, everyone's trying to work out how do, you, how do you find growth? How do we know where it's going to go up next? This is, the big, this is the big tricky thing, right? Where do I put my money where it's actually going to work for me? So for the, for the listener's reference, the website that you guys have got now is called htag.com.au. That's right. Yeah, yep. higher than average growth. And the premise of the platform that you've built uh, takes all of this data and allows you to look a little bit into the future to see where it's going to grow next. Is that right? That sums it up pretty okay. much. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But before you got to that, how were you doing the research beforehand? Like how were you aggregating all of this information? So I think, I think about our platform and how it works from a machine learning perspective. Sasha will explain that much better because he's the genius behind that. Um, in regards to, um, you know, what I used to do personally, let's say, to find out about properties is I would, you know, from magazines to ABS um, to um, other statistic collecting um, entities, you know, I would just try to compile all information into a tabulated form and try to compare and contra contrast. However, what I realised is because I, I don't have an economics background and I'm not an economist and, and in order to, I guess, find... Well, essentially causality, not correlation. That's the key term here, you know. Um, to find yeah. causality, um, I would need to be, I guess, skilled in areas that I didn't have, edu I guess, education in. So this is where Sasha and I began speaking about it and see, and we started, I mean, Sasha has an IT background himself and, and uh, we were, I guess, fascinated by the concept of big data and how it actually works. And, and we tried to apply that to the property industry where, you don't need to uh, potentially consider, you know, 90 or 100 variables in order to find out the growth potential of an area. You can maybe look at a single variable. However, um, that single variable, we need to generate um, large amounts of data, which is big data, in order for you or for the algorithm that you develop to be able to forecast and predict. So, and this is where we came, I guess, to our algorithm, what we developed. And I think Sasha can explain a bit more about that. Okay, awesome. So, who do, who do, who does what in the business? So Sasha, are you are you the are you the technical mind behind it? What's what's the go? I'm the techie. Uh, Matt is our knowledge lead. He leads all uh, knowledge in the company. Uh, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the I'm the mystery shopper. You know, I'm the mystery shopper. Sasha comes to me and says, "See, this is what we develop. What do you think?" And then. We together rip it apart, but I do most of that work. I'm kind of ripping it uh, okay, apart. Okay, let me rephrase that. So, Sasha, you make it. 
and and that you break it, right? That's right. That's right. That's okay. right. Then I fix it. And, and, then, and then it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Okay. So how do you take all this big data? Like, because this is the biggest, one of the biggest barriers. And it's part of the reason I started out in this industry as well was trying to take all of this information, just this mm. huge volumes of it and trying to firstly understand what information is relevant and then mm. how to collect it all and then how to work out which bits are related to which ones in a meaningful way and, and turn that into something usable. So tell us a little bit about how that works. Sure, I'll answer that question. Um, so we have uh, a crawler solution. A crawler is uh, a program that companies like Google uh, use to index uh, websites and the content on those websites and structure it and I guess then present that information back to the user in a meaningful mm. uh, way. So our crawler works in a similar way. It uh, indexes uh, property listings, um, both current and past, on uh, major um, Australian uh, websites. So um, I think you know what they are. Yeah. Um, as well as in small um, agent uh, websites and so on and so forth, right? So all of that gives us <clears throat> pretty much um, very rich um, uh, a very rich data set, which we then uh, build our statistical models on and uh, our machine learning algorithm uh, as well. The data is not only used to uh, predict the future or project uh, the future growth, it's also used to uh, construct the median values uh, for the current uh, period. Uh, and we go as far back as 2007-2008. Uh, That's kind of the starting point in our data set. You have a question. You were yeah, I do. Ha I do have a question. I do have a question. Okay, so what I just heard from you then is basically you've got a crawler and it, it's basically analyzing everything that's for sale and everything that's sold and all of that kind of stuff. And you're collecting all of that, aggregating all of that data, and then you're using that to project in the future. Is that right? Did I hear that correct? Uh, that's correct. Yes. Okay. So here's the here's a curveball for you though. Past past performance doesn't indicate future performance. So how do you how do you get past that barrier? Sure. So that's a commonly asked question, and it kind of uh, requires a bit of a uh, shift in uh, in the mindset and thinking. And this is where um, we commonly use an example. It's better to describe how the algorithm works with an example, so it's easier for non-technical people to understand it. Yep. Um, so let's take uh, Google Maps for an example. Um, we all use it. We all know how it works, so it's yep. easy to explain. You have an app, that app on your phone. Uh, you plan to go somewhere. You don't know how to get there yet because you've never been there before. You punch in the address, and it uh, creates a route for you. It also um, tells you what the... It recently, it started giving you options as to what route is best. It gives you, like, three or four of them. And um, when it does that, it essentially is predicting the future. It's, it's telling you that... It's going to take you that long to get from point A to point B. And the way this algorithm works is that it looks at historical data. It models the traffic patterns do for any given day during the week. It also records real-time data from the commuters that are in the cars driving nearby you. It combines that and it uh, pretty much gives you the prediction of that um, route, an optimal route. So Google predicted the future. Um, in a similar way, our algorithm works. There is a little caveat there, right? Um, when Google does that uh, prediction, it um, doesn't take into account uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of variables. It only looks at um, individual vehicles as they move along um, along that uh, path, and it uh, pretty much records how frequently do they stop, what speed they drive with, and how long on average does it take them to cross a, a part of that uh, route. That's so they essentially don't look at traffic lights, lanes, uh, tunnels, uh, works yeah. on the road. Uh, uh, all these other hurdles that you come across, other variables, let's call them variables. So they only look at the individual people who have an iPhone in the car and collect that data based on the speed, how, much, how many times they stop, et cetera, et cetera. 
Yeah, so, totally. I get it. So, so, but let's just talk about, let's just use that analogy for a moment, right? Yeah. So let's say I'm at my house, I'm in Bondi, right? And I want to travel to the CBD. Now yeah. it's, you know, and based on the time of day and the, and the day of the week and all of that kind of stuff, it'll have enough statistically relevant data to say that statistically at normally at say two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon, uh, on that section of road up ahead there at any given point in time, there might normally be a hundred cars. And based on if that bit has a hundred cars and that distance is X statistically, it should take you 23 minutes, whatever the case may be. Vice versa, if it you looked at the map and you did the route and there was only 50 cars on it, it might say, actually, you're going to get there in 15 minutes because there's less traffic on the road. So I, I kind of get it. I get the premise, right? It's looking at both what's happened and also what's actually happening and going, okay, well, based on that, we can make a fair assumption that you're going to get there somewhere between 15 and 23 minutes time. Okay. Yeah. I think I've got it right. That's, yeah. Yep. That's right. The challenge though, the challenge with that though, is that huh. property cycles are a hell of a lot more uh, wide and there's more, there are more types of vehicles on the road. It's not just cars. There's, as you mentioned, there's population, there's uh, government policy, there's uh, all kinds of different stuff. So also the cycles are much, much longer, right? So the you know, a property cycle in any given area has so many different influential factors that will drive it up or down or whatever. Mm-hmm. So how do you, how do you, how do you take that idea which i understand and make sense how do you combat so many variables in a in a meaningful way so i'll i'll, I'll try to attempt to answer this okay uh, give it a crack I'll, I'll attempt. <laughs> uh, so so um, you just said you, you mentioned one thing that's very important you're saying the property moves in cycles and the fact that it's an illiquid asset uh it means that it doesn't exchange hands as much as shares do so it makes it easier to predict but going going back um so if Property moves in cycles and a certain area exhibits, you know, like a, a bottom, then a rise, then a peak, and then down. And if you have data for, let's say, two cycles, and cycles can vary from six to ten years, whatever the literature says, I'm not sure. If you uh, accumulate amount of data for, for a substantial amount of time, going back 13, 14, 15 years, you've covered um, already a cycle and cycle and a half. So the prediction does not only learn from... Uh, the cars on the road now or the sales now, it actually learns from the cyclical information that's already happened two cycles back. So when it comes to population growth and all of that, to use the analogy, let's say, you know, you have a hazard on the road which you haven't envisaged or you have corona, you know, and prices start going down. You have a 2008 GFC or whatever it may be. If you already have cover data for two or more cycles, you've already collected data which subsumes within it um, uh, economic downturns from which the model learns and projects further. So that's the way it trains itself, essentially. It trains itself on past performance as well as the current data collected. Okay. So and how, evolves. how far back did you say your data goes? 2007 at this point, but some areas even further depending on where, on where you know, on, uh, depending on the statistical significance of data. And this is what we explain yeah. on our website. So I think for, for a projection to be statistically significant, we need to reach 30 sale points per council area and 10 sale points for a suburb, yeah? Per quarter. That's per quarter. Enough, per quarter. Okay. It's enough awesome. for a model to uh, be traded on and produce uh, its forecast. And how, how, how accurate is it? Uh, good question. So uh, you may have noticed on the website there is a column called confidence, uh, and the way we measure accuracy is by error rate. Um, we are transparent about uh, the, that error rate. It's uh, obvious on all the data that we produce, uh, and it ranges between, you know, high, medium, and low. Um, high has an error rate below five percent, medium under ten percent, and uh, low uh, under fifteen percent. So that's the error rate. So how? I mean, I think it's it's also good to to explain how we came about that error rate. So we actually collect the data and forecast the data in the past. So let's say we collect the data for two thousand up to 2015 and mm. uh, ignored data past 2015. Our model projected then uh, from 2015 yeah. to 2017. Um, and we do this on a regular basis. And we, you overlay, overlay it over the past. Correct. And we overlay and see what, what yeah. has actually happened. Yeah, based on, uh, based on the machine learning, if that was if I went back five years, would it be accurate in 2016, 17 or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. It. Awesome. Sweet. Okay, cool. So really- a, sorry, sorry, because the interesting thing there is that 
What's exciting to me, at least, um, is the fact that as more time passes, the model becomes more robust. Yeah. So, so as more data points are collected, uh, as more cycles are taken into account, uh, we're going to come to a point where most probably, and Sasha can answer this, we'll be able to project further into the future, maybe three or four years potentially, depends on an error rate, or the certainty within the two-year projection is going to get much closer, I guess. So the error rate is going to diminish. Mm. Yeah, because everything's everything's based. Is it based on artificial intelligence or machine learning? And what's the distinctive difference in a very succinct format? So, machine learning um, is commonly referred to um, as an algorithm that takes in large amounts of data, processes, and creates and learns on it and produces some output. AI is kind of a broader. Um, definition of uh, what a smart algorithm may, might do, right? It doesn't necessarily o- operate on data, but it's, it's smart. So as close to human behavior as possible, that's AI. Um, so we deal with machine learning and not AI. Um, we're not, not creating robots. Uh, you know, <laughs> not yet, not yet. Not cyber not yet. is going to take <laughs> over the world. At the, at, the, at the rate you guys are going, in a couple of years, you'll probably have some kind of artificial intelligence cyborg buyer's agent going out to these places and finding <laughs> well, well, yeah, that, that actually leads to, to what we chat <laughs> further. You know, can technology actually help us or, or create problems in the future, you know? Yeah, this is, this is going to be one of my questions. So we're leaning yeah. now into like machine intelligence and all of this kind of stuff going, okay, cool. How much faith can people put into that? And how how can this, like, how how can this shape people's uh, investing journey? Like, how where do you see this going? Well, well, I mean, for me personally, I guess, I mean, the, because of the vision that we had at the beginning, um, essentially, it's meant to assist and help make things easier, more simple. And I mean, I, I uh, to tell you the truth, Chris, I mean, I learned a lot about investing and the overall how the overall market functions but just simply using the platform that we develop which sounds a bit counterintuitive but um it, it's it's essentially meant because every person has a di- different circumstance mm. you know uh, yes our model does predict in future um prices or you know uh, rental growth and provides you with cycles and all of that but your financial uh, circumstance are different your personal situation is different, which means that the property that you pick based on what we, the information that you provide uh, can be completely different from an individual to an individual. So at the end of the day, there's still that interpretation element there, which cannot be subcontracted out to a machine, if you know what I mean. Um, there still needs to be an individual there who does the interpretation uh, based on his circumstance and what he wants to do in future. Yeah. So the pro Platform is there to help and assist. Uh, it's not our vision is not to replace anything. It is to simplify investment. However, uh, the interpretation element for each and every individual still remains, and 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 is one of the main factors. Okay, so do you ever think, and we're to, we're going a little futurist right now, but I'll, I'll, yeah. let's go there. Do you think though that with um, you know machine learning advancements in like progressive advancement of the technology and the intelligence of the algorithms as it goes, do you can you ever conceive a point where uh, somebody could, for, for example, they have a starting point where they go, okay, here's my starting financial position, great, and here's my goals, right, and maybe it's all connected to their bank account or some other such way, but property purchasing it all just happens on autopilot and it's just like okay. It, it's all just happening for me and there's an automatic portfolio that's being generated and selected and acquired through automations and, and artificial intelligence and or, or, or machine learning. Do you think it could ever go that far or oh, no? Yeah, I, I, I think not. You know why? Because, I mean, we, we human beings, we change from one second to another. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our needs change, our desires change, our circumstances change. We can lose a job or we can get a job. We can get an increase in salary. So we can have a snapshot of our portfolio, put it into a machine and tell us this is the best thing you can do. That's all good and fine. But then tomorrow, you know, um, you know, I might receive news that my wife is pregnant, um, which completely changes the entire scenario. So yeah. uh, unless you replace individuals with machines as well, 
then, you know, then it's a completely different story. But as long as we're here and we stay, I think we're safe. Basically, what you're saying is as long as we're really indecisive and emotional and as, and as long as we as correct, long as we correct. changing our mind every 10 minutes, exactly. we're, never, we're exactly. never going to be replaced and by this. going to happen. I think if somebody develops a platform for that, I'll be their customer, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting proposition, though, because theoretically, like theoretically, why couldn't you have a user base? I mean, you can trade Comsec shares on your phone. So, like, the, the, theoretically, like, why couldn't you have an automatic acquisition strategy? Just, just putting it out there, guys. You might want to think about that. But yeah, uh, yeah, 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 no, that's it's noted. It's noted. There's a, there's a guy <laughs> in the corner of the room taking notes as we speak. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Okay, cool. All right. So, the advantage, the advantage then of using stuff like m- machine learning algorithms, you've pointed out, it's not perfect. You can't make an investing decision based on just like some numbers on a computer screen. You're still going to overlay human due diligence and human uh, interaction and emotion. So what, like, I guess what disadvantages might there be? Or, or, you know, like if someone was like, someone's listening to this going, oh my God, I can get a cyborg basically to go and help me make my investment decision. What are the pros? What are the cons? How can this both help and hinder someone's journey like this? Well, uh, I think uh, a con that I've, can call out is uh, uh, pretty much something we don't have data on, right? Um, mm-hmm. And that's uh, a, a big pain point for data companies. Yes, you can uh, create a product and service that relies on, on data, but if there is no data, um, you can't do much. So uh, the con there would be if there is, uh, I guess, some undiscovered uh, secret market in Australia that hasn't have had any se- uh, past sales ever, then um, we don't know about it, but uh, neither do you and probably nobody else. Uh, but at the same time, it's possible. It's likely. It's probably an edge case. Um, yeah. And that's where maybe a, a, a scenario where a human cannot be replaced by data or machine or, or an AI of any sort when applicable to a property investment. I guess, yeah. I guess it does happen. I mean, sorry to, to interject here. It does happen. I'll give you an example. So... First thing is our service is not purely about forecasting median price growth. Um, and, and if we look at every, um, I guess, page on our, on our platform, uh, there is much more to it when combined can produce a completely different picture than if you solely look at the forecasted price growth. Um, I mean, we have growth rate cycles there, heat maps, you know, um, you know their dwelling types, you can choose yeah. the rooms and all of that. It, it's, it's sort of like a bit, it's moving. And this goes back to your question about variables. So, I mean, there are there's a lot of factors that need to be considered about when you, when you make an investment decision. Um, and good thing about collecting large amounts of data for a single variable, which is median price, is that um, any economic stimulus, if you want to call it, let's mm-hmm. say population growth or whatever it is, uh, that has impacted an area has already been reflected within that price growth that's been collected. So let's say... You have an area in southwest Sydney, which is, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure being built around, you know, Battery Creek Airport is going in there. There's a lot of money being pushed down that way. So one thing, you can drive around and see that there's investments, okay, I'll buy. But the second thing is there's already people buying properties based on that, which is reflected Mm -hmm. in the median price growth and increase. So all of these other variables, such as infrastructure investment and population growth, has sort of already been accounted for in the price that's grown which makes it a single variable decision. But, but you need to have a large amount of data collected for it. So, sorry, just to go back. Going back to uh, what you asked about, you know, Ken, Sasha said about there not being data in about an area. So I, I used to live in, in around Camden, um, which is close to Badgery Creek yep. um, Airport. And I remember in, uh, if I recall back, 2000 and... Uh, you know, this is a guess now. 2004, I went on a council website and they called it Southwest Growth Corridor. So it's called this North, North, Northwest Growth Corridor and Southwest. Southwest Growth Corridor was because of, you know, Badger's Creek and all of that. And, and the council's pretty much stipulated there's going to be a lot of investment in the area. At that time, there was no infrastructure being built. Even buyers agents that I was seeing, um, I was suggesting that area to them, a couple of companies actually, they didn't even know about it. Um, and, and well, the data, if I was collecting data back then and doing a forecast, well, that area wouldn't have been 
something great, you know, a great area to invest in. You know what I mean? Maybe there wouldn't have even been data for some of the suburbs there now. Well, like Oran Park is an example, let's say. Oran Park, there was no Oran Park back then, but I think the price Oran Park grew by, I don't know, I'm guessing you would know maybe better by 10 or 15% in a year, you know? Yeah. Um, so essentially, well, yes, there wasn't data back then. If somebody knew, preempted everything before the area started being developed and bought there, uh, but then that would be an individual choice. It wouldn't be based on advice provided from us or by us. Yeah, for that. sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, at the end, of, you're only showing a data set. You're not saying this is the truth and it's like it's based on. That's right. That's right. So that's can right. I ask, in, in your experience, both of you, what's, what's analyzing all of this data? What are the biggest drivers of growth? Is it just purely cyclical or what do you see is the, if someone was to look out for it, what would be the biggest drivers they could look out for? Well, we've done a, we've done a regression analysis at the beginning of, 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 um, See, this That's is the right. thing. When we, when we began our platform, we, we wanted to see, should we include all of the variables or just look at one? The normal response would be, well, you need to include all the variables. So Sasha has completed a regression analysis using, a, a, I don't know, a model or software. I don't know, I'm not sure what he was using um, to see which variables correlate with price growth the most in different areas. And this is interesting. So it's not always population and it's not always building approvals. And it's not always unemployment. It's one over the other and one much more than all of the others. Um, and it changes, changes um, when you move from one area to another, it changes. You can't replicate it. So let's say in Camden, you can see a strong correlation between population growth and price growth. But then in Perth, there's a strong correlation between building approvals and price growth. If you do it only mathematically and statistically. Yeah. I'm looking for correlation, not causality here. So there's a difference there. So... You know, it, 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 there's no one straight answer, I would say. I don't know whether you would agree. Yeah, there's no one hard, fast rule to tell you which variable or which set of variables influences the price growth in a particular area. But uh, there is a, a commonality there where um, obviously areas that are in close proximity to each other evolve along the same uh, pattern, right? So the price growth would be similar, although different. Um, and some neighboring areas, I guess, grow with a bit of a lag as opposed to... Yeah, the ripple effect. ripple effect and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but uh, that is also actually a part of um, the, the, the data that we use in our algorithm inherently because we input data for a particular area into the model, but uh, we also... Um, add data for neighboring areas, and that trains the model uh, better. So that ripple effect is taken into account when uh, the prices are forecasted. So um, the, the answer is I don't think there's one particular variable that affects property growth and it can be replicated across. It's like, and this is why we chose, this is why we, tr we, we used um, different options for to see what works best. And the model predicts the best with a single variable, which is interesting. And to me, that was counterintuitive at the onset. So hang on. So there's multiple different variables. It could be any number of a, yes. a set of different variables that will indicate price growth in a specific area. So it could be population growth, could be, could be uh, building approvals, could be, you know, infrastructure. Unemployment infrastructure, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all that kind of stuff. So, but then you're saying you get the most accurate forecast if you base it on on one one of those variables. Or what did you mean by that? Uh, okay. I can answer that. So it it is uh, one variable, but it's uh, represented in many different ways. Uh, so first of all, is the the reason why machine learning works is because it operates on high volumes of data, yep. which we now have thanks to our crawler solution. Uh, second is that um, you can actually input price over and over again into the model uh, represented uh, differently. So that example about neighboring uh, suburbs, right? Even though we operate on one variable, but to the model, it looks uh, like it is, let's say, 15 variables if there are 15 suburbs in uh, an LG. Yeah. So, um, yes, one variable, many representations of the same variable, cyclicity built in, a relation between neighboring areas built in. Okay. So when I say, when I was referring to saying variables, thinking of price and then population growth, unemployment and all of that. So yeah. 
With us, it's fund variable, it's price only, but it's represented differently. When yeah. we put into our model, I remember at the onset, we put in population growth, building approvals, unemployment, what else, and price together. Uh, there were qu a few more. I don't remember all of them now. And uh, you correctly said at the start that, uh, yeah, there, there would probably only ever be one that is uh, correlated at a significant level that we Just could it. potentially use. But it's not something we wanted to do because that means we'd want to train the model for each individual suburb in Australia, which is an expensive exercise, an expensive not in terms of money, but in time and effort that you would spend on it. We need to hire, you know, uh, thousands of people just to sit and, and uh, come up with that statistical model that would work for one particular area. And it wouldn't um, guarantee that it would be better, though, as well. Correct. Um, and uh, when we tested it, uh, so we took this, the traditional statistical modeling approach where you uh, input all the variables that you, you have, and then one by one uh, you discard one, uh, them until you get to a point where you have the ones that matter, right? And when we did, there was no um, one hard and fast rule that we could apply uh, to all the areas in Australia. Uh, and in some cases, it actually uh, performed worse when we inputted that additional area that was supposed to be statistically significant, uh, as opposed to when we used the big data uh, solution. That's, 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 that's really interesting because you have a lot of people, uh, you know, property experts and all of that kind of stuff. Everyone sort of hangs their hat on something. You know, the, some people are like, oh, population growth is the biggest driver. And some people say, ah, oh, it's infrastructure. It's very interesting to see that you guys took a very data-centric approach and actually went, well, it's kind of all of them and none of them all at the same time. You know, like it's, it is, it's dependent and completely dependent, which is really, which is really interesting uh, perspective to have on the scenario, particularly with, with the voices you hear in the marketplace. So let me ask you guys, where do you, where do you see yourselves going with this platform? Because it's pretty cool. There's obviously a lot of really amazing uh, stuff going on with it. And it's, it's definitely it, it's fascinating, tr truly fascinating. And I think it can really help a lot of people. But where do you see, where do you see this going? Uh, sure. We have... Uh, Thanks, by the way. Yes. No worries. Really yeah. appreciate it. Um, we have uh, quite a few uh, features planned in the near term uh, future. Uh, the biggest one of them and that is most commonly requested is uh, listing data and discounting data, which we plan on adding um, hopefully soon. We'll see how we go. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, what we'd want to, or the goal we'd want to get to in the end is uh, making or getting close to that example you gave uh, to us in the beginning where you have uh, an AI that does everything for you. We'll never get there. Like there's no magic uh, technology that can possibly be that, but we'll not try. Not yet, not yet, not yet. We'll yeah. try and get as close as possible, as, as possible as we can. Uh, that's the, that's the Sing end. Singularity, property investment singularity, that's what we're well, after. And should, you shouldn't be worried. I mean, you're not going to be without a job, just by the way. So, Mate, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, mate, I'm, I'm just looking, I'm looking I'm, for the machine. I I'm think just I like, need to be clear about that because you know what we're finding? Essentially, a lot of people... Um, including me at the onset, uh, I did not know how to interpret data that was presented to me. Yeah. Um, you know, one feature that's really uh, been hard for a lot of people to understand is our, uh, we call it GRC or the growth rate cycle. Um, and it's essentially documenting um, the changes in the growth rate within a particular area. And because it's sort of counterintuitive where um, an area can be will show that it's declining but it's still growing in value um, and, and this will take another three hours to actually explain properly. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> but um, um, it, it's extremely useful, by the way, because it sort of um, gives you a way into what's going to happen before you use a property clock, let's say, before mm. you reach the bottom. What's, what, where's the area before the bottom, you know, and things like that, which we'll issue a blog, a blog about soon and a video about. But... Um, what I'm trying to say is that um, for some people, uh, as I said, including me, it was very hard to interpret the data that we have, and it will always be. You know, as the service gets more complex or new variables are added, there's always going to need their, uh, there's always uh, people going to be needed to actually tell their customers how this data that's been provided affects their current circumstance. And that's what I said at the beginning. You know? So, um, but, you know, we're trying to get to a point where it's used both as an educational tool, but also as a tool that 
is a big overview and a good, I guess, benchmark to, to base your decisions on. Yeah, well, totally. And it's like, it's like any kind of new thinking paradigm, right? And, and you're right. For a lot of people right now, it's going to be way too complex. But just like when Copernicus did all these mathematics and was, you know, creating models of the universe, most people at that time were like, dude, what's what's wrong with you? I can't understand this. Like, Was was Copernicus burnt, burnt at the stake or was it Galileo? Who was burnt at the stake? No, he, 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 <laughs> one, I can't remember one, one of them, right? But it's, that, it's that same kind of thinking. It's like, no, 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 nah, I don't understand it. Whereas the reality is once you learn how to leverage that information, then it actually completely expands the potential of not That's only yourself right. but future generations, which is why I, I think it's fascinating. I love to uh, learn about how the interrelationships between all this data and all this kind of stuff. Can we well, can we ask you a question though? By the way, you can ask me whatever um, you want. I, I, I um, you've been um, it's interesting. I mean, we we track and monitor how people that you know and how what questions they ask and what they're interested in, and, and you've been really, I mean, what we call an early adopter, I guess. Um, in the way the questions that you've asked and things that you requested. And, and this is another thing, you know, we'll develop a feature, we'll work with, you know, we have partnered with many buyers agents um, up until now. I mean, recently we just partnered with the Buyers Agency Institute in Melbourne as well. And, and there's a lot of questions being asked of us and we're going to develop, I guess, a sort of a feature where we're working with buyers agents to produce new features that are very useful. Um, so... Um, would you, Would you? I mean, I wanted to actually ask you, if you have a few things documented about our new features and stuff, would you like to run your eyes over it and see whether it would be useful for you and get you yeah, involved absolutely. in the process, I guess? You know? uh, absolutely, because, uh, and actually there's, I, I do actually, I actually do that with a few different um, uh, companies that are like testing ideas because I will never look at it and go, oh, so, okay, that's what it does. Oh, does that work for me? Or yes or no? I'll always be like, why is it doing that? And how could it do something different? And what if it did something different? What would that do? Exactly. And if that was different, then what would that mean? And because exactly, I, I tr- exactly. yeah, I think I think that nothing exists right now that gives us everything that we want. And the only way to find the answers that we want is to basically just keep poking things. Just keep on probe, poking yeah. and keep probing exactly. until you can get to the answers. And at the end of the day, once you can get to that point, you, you open up a. a a, f- a spectrum of knowledge, understanding, and opportunity that that's previously been untapped. You know that's where that's where the true wells of potential lie is through questioning. So yeah, absolutely, bring it on. If you want to, I'll be your guinea pig. Let's test it out. Yeah, no, no worries. I mean, yeah, it's um, yeah, as I said, it's interesting. Like we love to speak to people such as yourself who are really early adopters and understand the benefits that can see even the gaps. Um, yeah. We love the gaps. Um, well, essentially, that is my job in the company. Like, try to look for gaps. And I need a, 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 a like. <laughs> I want you to look at my gaps, and I look <laughs> at their gaps, and we'll go into. That sounds, that sounds a little saucy. That sounds a little saucy. That sounds a little saucy. <laughs> well, uh, I, can, I can look at your gaps if you want, mate. <laughs> I won't tell my partner. We'll be right. But that's okay. Um, but no, hundred percent. Now, I've got one last question before we before we start to wrap it up, though. Sure, mate. Like, I speak to. I'm not a parent, right? I don't. Are you guys parents? Yeah. 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 Okay. Have you had to like? You know how how is it? You teaching your kid? You get teach them to go to the toilet, stuff like that. How's how does that yeah, work? At that stage at the moment. Okay. Yeah. How, the, how okay? Oh, as I understand it, not being a parent, it's pretty tricky. Like learning how to train a kid. How the hell do you train uh, uh, an algorithm? Um, well, it's actually much easier to train an algorithm than it is to train a child. So. <laughs> <laughs> Providing you know what you're doing, so I guess it doesn't have to go to the toilet. So there's a start. Exactly. I got my kid naked all the time and he was running around the house all the time. So I, you can't do that to an algorithm, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Exactly. Uh, well, it, it, it's it very similar. Like when the way you train a model is very similar to how human, um, I guess, training in early adults uh, works. So you experience things and uh, you remember your mistakes and you learned, uh, learned based on that. In the same way, uh, the algorithm can be trained uh, like that, right? So, um, and that's why it's important that we always test it by going back a year or two and then compare the results. That's kind of the mistake. Uh, if, if an algorithm made, made a mistake, then it's penalized. 
and it tries again until it gets better based on a set of parameters. That's kind of the high level. Okay, so it is basically saying you're going to feed it a good diet of nice, healthy data. That's why I run uh, 4 a.m. in the morning and, and yeah, all that. Ex- exactly, and you've got to <laughs> course correct it, when it, let it know when it does good stuff and let it know when it does bad stuff and keep feeding it a healthy That's diet. Right. Okay, makes we sense. We don't condone smacking, though. We don't condone smacking. <laughs> it's just course correcting. <laughs> Well, you don't want to start smacking algorithms because if we do reach singularity, they're going to remember and they'll be coming out. Oh, true. Exactly. True. All right. Awesome. (laughs) Awesome, guys. Well, look, um, uh, uh, Matt, I'd love to keep pressure testing your um, platform and I think it's got a lot of benefits now. Before we wrap up, is there anything you want to share with with investors that are listening to this that want to get a leading edge advantage uh, in in doing their own research and all of that kind of stuff? Have you got any last messages for them? Uh, join our website, uh, have a look. There is a free tier. Um, you're welcome to explore. Um, and uh, when you're ready, uh, sign up. We're always there. There is a chat uh, bot on the website. Uh, it, it's not smart yet, so it actually goes to a human. There will be a human talking to you. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's me, sometimes it's Matt. So, uh, yeah, we're more than happy to help investors out, anyone who's interested in property, data. You're welcome. Awesome. And there's a lot of information on the blogs. You guys are pretty prolific on the blogs explaining stuff. So there's a lot of educational material there as well. And what's the website again, just to make sure I don't stuff it up? htag.com.au, htag htag.com.au. Awesome, guys. Well, thanks so much for your time. We took what could have been a very dry uh, kind of subject matter. And we, and we, I'm pretty sure we made it interesting and informative and, ed, and educational, all of that Thanks, kind of bro. stuff. So I appreciate your time and um, I look forward to continuing the conversation offline. Mm-hmm.